We are live. Welcome back to Midfit Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. I have Dr. Robin Faith Walsh with us today. How are you, Robin? I'm okay. <laughs> we were just talking about all the rec letters I'm writing today, so I'm, I'm trying to switch gears. That was the wrong question to open the stream. <laughs> Should have been like, I hope your day is better today uh, going forward, uh, Dr. Walsh. But yeah, no, you know, it, it's fine. Life is life throws us lemons. Let's make lemonade and try and add some sugar to it. Um, yeah, exactly. What are the gospels, right? This is something you can read several scholars in several ways, and they will draw different kinds of conclusions, especially depending on what kind of school of scholarship they're coming from how they're evaluating this literature and your book. Let me share the screen for those who aren't aware the origins of early Christian literature. You're trying to, from what I understand, you're right. You're trying to place the gospels within a Greco Roman literary culture and what that might look like in that literature. So you have the book. Um, you have a website for those who are interested in checking out the website. There's much here you can check out. And I don't, what's this here? Linktree? Oh, your Linktree. Yeah, Linktree. Yeah. Okay. You can do that. We also have a course on MVP courses on the gospels. And then we have one on Paul and you know, you did both courses. So you can take an online class at your own pace uh, on the gospels and on the apostle Paul from Dr. Walsh. We have that pinned in the comment section and in the description to give you an idea of what it looks like here. The Gospel Masterclass, Understanding the Gospels as Literature. This this is all put together by Ryan. So, you know, you and Ryan did it all. I'm proud of you, you know, for doing it. Looks good. This is going to make noise, isn't it? Oh, I muted it. To show people, you know, this is the gospel specifically. Um, and we have the Paul course, of course, as well. And then the book, you got to get the book. Anyway, enough of the uh, promoting here, uh, Dr. Walsh. I mean, we, we have some conversation we can have back and forth about the Gospels, but we are hoping people will sign up for the courses because this is my way. These are my words. I'm the one saying them. This is my way of showing appreciation to scholars like you and to try and kind of create a movement online where we can take academics and make them appreciate the public platforms and say, hey, I want to talk more to people. Um, this helps my family feed my family. This helps me be motivated. And there's a lot of compliments that come with putting yourself out here with the knowledge you have, because there's so many students that see your work and go, whoa, this is, I want more of what Robin is putting out there. Well, that's, that's really nice of you to say. I mean, a big motivation for doing this is, um, like you say, to make this kind of knowledge more accessible to a wide audience. And, you know, I, I can speak uh, a little bit for myself. I mean, obviously there's the democratizing education and um, the important ethic behind that. For me, it's also um, teaching me a lot, not only about how to relate to my students, to think about not just making things uh, very high-minded, you know, or complex. It's, it's helpful for me um, to sort of metabolize this material in more accessible ways. Um, but I mean, let's be honest, college is so expensive. <laughs> not everybody can go. And I'm not saying that I'm like, you know, the be all end all of like education on this issue. But, you know, the more voices that are out there, I think to give, like you were saying, different schools or a range of possible interpretations that are out there, I think the better. Um, and then the other thing is back to what I've learned from this process is sometimes it can be hard to figure out. I mean, we're talking about ancient, dusty old <laughs> texts, right? Um, and placing the Gospels in conversation with other first and second century literature, that necessarily means we're talking about like ancient Greece and Rome. So, you know, Plato, Virgil, those kinds of guys. And, you know, it's very easy to be like, what does that have to do with anything, right? Like in today, in 2024, when we're recording this, like with day-to-day -day life, but the less I'm kind of in that ivory tower uh, and the more uh, I look around because I'm not particular, you know, myself part of like a faith based perspective, I'm realizing, you know, how much good can be done from offering these kinds of courses too to help people understand where our interpretations come from, the nature of our sources, 
um, how we've gotten here. Um, and I think it can do a lot of good. So not, not to make it sound too lofty, but um, those are things I've learned <laughs> in the process of trying to put this kind of thing together. Uh, well, I appreciate you on this journey as an academic, you know, people think of PhDs and they go, they have it all. They figured it out. I feel like the more you learn, the more you realize, right? The more you're like, hold up, there's more to this. There's so many more levels to this. And yeah. is it safe to say, like just getting on the context of the gospels, is it safe to say that our evidence of, well, well, let me let me back up a little about the gospels and ask it this way. Okay. What do you think about the way the gospels have been viewed in scholarship, especially post enlightenment, as I would say, more serious, rigorous academia came into the picture. I know that you but talk about how it was. It used to be viewed, or like commonly viewed, or just scholarship in general. I'm, I guess I'm saying up to contemporary times. Like a lot of people are reading them. You know, the the, the early church fathers call them memoirs, right? They they. Yeah. they they're reading them as if these are some type of, in the way they understand it, historical literary text with a little legend, maybe. If Obviously, if they're serious scholars or they're serious about the truth, I would say without a doubt, there's legend there. And that goes for believer and non-believer, right? Like you've realized, I'm sure as you've gone into the public arena, how much of a battle there is over you know, is this real history through and through and the apologetics versus the non, especially in America. But I'm asking in scholarship, the way that the scholarship's heading and there's, there's this, well, I think I can glean Mark and I think this is history. Oh, I think that's legend. What do you think about that? Do you think that's a few, like a feudal, like we're wasting our time? Well, I think what I try to do in the book is point out that I, I think the fundamental problem, if I'm understanding the question correctly, is that um, there's sort of myth making around these texts that goes on and it can take a variety of different keys, right? Or it can look um, different ways depending on who you are. And so I think what tends to happen is that um, because these texts have such import, especially, and because people, you know, hang a lot of their li life perspective on them, right? It's hard to imagine them as just kind of practical day to day pieces of writing. And so one thing I tried to do in the book is say, like, let's just go like back to basics. And we do this in the course too. I think this is like really how we structured the course, like back to basics. How do you even write one of these things? Like, what do you need in front of you? Like, just like the technical side of it, like how much money do you need to have to be able to afford to write something like this? Uh, if you have a patron who's supporting you, what did that look like? what did it look like to go to school to get to the level that we see in the gospels in terms of like the kind of Greek? What does it tell us about who the gospel authors are? What can we then determine based on what we know about ancient literary practices or how authors, you know, put things together, how they published in the ancient world? You know, what did that look like? And what can we tell about their social exchange and context based on these things? Because I think usually the emphasis is on that question. Is it historical? Is it not historical? Rather than, what did it look like to write? <laughs> and like, how are these guys as writers? Now, I'm not saying scholarship, like you were saying, you know, modern scholarship, how, you know, where is it at? Um, that's not to say scholars haven't noticed, for example, that the gospels look a lot like an ancient biography and borrow some of those tropes, you know, or that say like, you know, of course, the first thing that comes to my mind when I say that is the gospel of Luke with the preface, you know, that looks like the kind of preface you find in historiography in the ancient world. Like all of that, um, you know, those are factors. Uh, and that people have recognized. But what's really interesting to me is to say, like, pretend you found the Gospels and treat them like you would treat any other kind of piece of literature in the first century. Like, forget all the other 2,000 years, <laughs> you know, since they were written to now. What would you say about them? And you would say, like, wow, they look an awful lot, you know, like the kind of writings that we see with historiographers, biographers, etc. Once you recognize that, the question doesn't really become, is it historical or not, any more than you'd ask that question of like, I don't know, Plutarch or, you know, uh, an ancient historiographer. It becomes, you know, what tropes and methods and approaches do you see represented in the Gospels that you also see elsewhere that's common to writers in this period? Because regardless of your faith-based perspective, the, you know, and what you think the Gospels represent in that respect, 
they are still written by human beings. <laughs> now you can think those human beings are inspired, you know, again, whatever kind of structure you want to put um, on those texts. What I'm trying to do is put them in a specific social context that helps us understand what kind of literary choices were made along the way. Uh, and to what extent do they show us? Because any human being who's writing is going to show their location. They're going to show, here's what I've been reading. Here's how you know to read my, my work more than the guy next door, right? Because I'm doing it in a better way, or I have better references, or I understand the history of the field. You know, whenever these guys, we talk about this in the course too, are deciding I'm going to write in Koine Greek, and I'm going to write the story about this Judean you know, messianic figure, I'm going to reflect on the law, you know, everything else that you see, but I'm also going to kind of do this in a key where I'm engaging the literature of biography and paradoxography and historiography, other things people are reading in the first century. The gospel authors are doing all of that. And I think it makes for a really interesting sort of new approach. Again, not new to say people didn't recognize comparison, but to really focus on, you know, comparison with other kinds of literature, but to really recognize that we need to place these guys not in that mythological context. And I say guys because it's most likely a guy <laughs> writing the Gospels, but not within that context of mythology or, you know, an aspirational context, but one that really tries to ground them and understand where they're coming from. Because understanding them as writers rather than as, you know, people representing Christian communities or debating the questions of historical Jesus, etc. That's been done quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to change the conversation a little bit um, to put in a different emphasis. So as far as the Gospels go, you brought up some really interesting things we would like to know about these authors. And I'm not getting into the who wrote mark if mark wrote mark none of that i'm just simply saying based on the gospels let's just scratch that about the whole i'll call it the myth of christian origin for this literature and and all let's just go beyond that into the scope of where academics are and they say hey okay these are pieces of literature what uh, based on your observation of the gospels maybe you start with mark are they doing what are they using You've mentioned, and this is one of the things I always get tickled by when I hear you talk about the Aeneid, Virgil, that you think Mark's doing something here with. Oh yeah. It seems he's competing. But what are what is the Gospels doing? What are they trying to do, and and what kinds of evidence would you point to other than maybe Virgil's Aeneid, and you can tease us about that? Other literature, maybe. Well, I mean, they're very well aware of uh, what else is out there. I mean, they're not inventing a genre, even though we talk about the gospel as if it's its own genre in some ways. Um, but that's really a later sort of attribution to them. Uh, you can tell that the gospel authors um, are aware just like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take the bait and I'll talk about <laughs> the Aeneid um, for a second. But I do have a piece, yeah, coming out uh, in the, there's something called the next quest of the historical Jesus. It should be coming out, honestly. I expect to get the final page proofs any day. So it should be coming out soon. And all I say in that piece is, um, so take for Mark the messianic secret what we tend to call the messianic secret. So this idea that, you know, especially in the first half of the gospel, every time Jesus performs sort of a remarkable act of some kind, a healing, uh, an exorcism, etc., If people witness it, he tends to say like, like, don't tell anybody who I am. Uh, and the other thing that the text does, if he's not proactively, proactively doing that is it says, and everybody saw what he did and they were amazed and they were stunned and they didn't know how to make sense of it. And they, you know, couldn't understand what was going on. It almost made them insane. Like it's like really extreme language about like confusion and bewilderment. The word in Greek there is thauma. Uh, and there are lots of different kinds of writing in the first and second centuries that are thauma writings. Um, so paradoxography I mentioned before is one. And usually those are huge collections of like sort of, okay, paradox offers get upset at this, but I'm going to say for the sake of illustration, like a Ripley's believe it or not, like, can you believe they found a centaur, <laughs> like, you know, an X, Y, Z, what place, and they brought it back to Rome. And if you go to the, you know, emperor's storehouse, you can, you can look at it yourself. Or um, did you know that there was a baby born with the head of Anubis and we threw it in the Tiber? <laughs> it kind of like goes for all these sort of remarkable stories. What's interesting about that is usually the way time is kept in those stories is so-and-so was governor of this region when XYZ happened, which sounds also, by the way, like 
Gospel of Luke, you know, uh, right. when he's telling they're time. They're trying to, to put verisimilitude to the to the legend, to the myth. But this is what I mean. Like you, you have to make it intelligible. Like people reading this thing will recognize if you do that. Like oh, we're we're having like you know these are remarkable sort of wonder stories in the context of a biography, uh, and you know t- telling us about a particular time and place that is in the past, but about a certain central figure. And in the case of the Messianic Secret um, and the Thalma language, uh, what I argue there is that this idea of the hero of a story like that, of a biography, or in the case of, you know, thinking about Homer or Virgil, you know, some kind of epic, some foundational epic, usually the hero is not recognized. And guess what word is used <laughs> when the hero isn't recognized? Thalma, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, or if it's not the hero, you know, some kind of central and sometimes subversive figure. So in the particular article I'm talking about, I, I argue that the way that Camilla is presented in um, Virgil is very, very similar. She marches in, she's kind of a warrior figure, like she's, you know, like a militaristic figure, even though she's a woman. And when she'll like march into town, people are like awestruck, dumbfounded, like they almost go out of their minds. They don't know how to process this. It's all the same kind of like what we call the messianic secret. Then you can explain it not as like some big theological claim. Well, you know, not to say it's not making a theological point, but that's not all that's going on. What's also going on there is a literary device that people are going to recognize as readers, as writer. You know, you know that this is successful to, you know, put that kind of Thalma language, especially into a story which the Gospels are also acting a bit like a foundational epic, right? Like it's got a lot of features. And I, I mean, I want to be careful here because this is Dennis McDonald's territory. <laughs> you know, like I, I know you've talked to him a lot. Um, but this idea of, you know, the Gospel writers being really familiar with that tradition. And so you see those kinds of, I, I almost think of it like structure. You know, um, there's got to be a certain structure to the Gospels, literary structure, and you see it elsewhere, and they're building on that same kind of idea, in part because the Gospel authors are trying to communicate clearly that Jesus is an important figure, that what happened is significant, uh, and that you should pay attention to it, especially if you're not already in the in-group, right? Like, so depending how these texts are circulating. And so, of course, you're going to have to put Jesus on par with, you know, these other texts that everybody else is learning on at school or they've heard about or they're reading. I mean, we even know in places like Pompeii, people um, who were not literate, you know, like people who we wouldn't consider writers in the ancient world had enough education to sometimes, you know, sort of clumsily, but write like a line of Virgil that they know on, you know, the side of a wall or on the bottom of a pot or something like that. We know people are like enjoying these stories. Right. Um, And so, the the gospels in many ways echo this and the gospel authors are clearly aware of these kinds of tropes there's so much there that i i love learning about this because i used to look at these as like magical perfect actually what happened in every single situation fundamentalist kind of mindset and it, it is what happened and and you can absolutely trust that what they said is what occurred and i think there's a bit of almost like a child's innocence to that because you're not really acquainted with all the other material and all the other works and you're not heuristically comparing or at least saying, let me fairly look at this like I'm looking at everything else. And um, I think the big hiccup, and I've interviewed you in the past about this, is that Luke's beginning, right? The very beginning, which some scholars think was added at the prologue, that was tacked on later. Some think it was there from the start. Dennis McDonald famously says in the conversations with me, he's like, man, look, he does a half ass job introducing it as if it's historiography and then seven verses, 11 verses later, angels are flying down. So it just sounds unbelievable. And anyone writing a historiography that is trying to be taken actually serious wouldn't write that way and not actually try to be more careful. What are your thoughts about stuff like that? Because there's a there's been a debate. I'm bringing up kind of a different ideas here. M. David Litwa, how the Gospels became history, and then you have more of a mythography combination of biography, combination of various stuff, um, like uh, Dr. Richard C. Miller, who thinks that they're more cultic texts. They're not necessarily like trying to write fake history. Um, yeah. 
they, they're not trying to write a history in a sense, a historiography. And so where do you fall in the spectrum between they're pulling one over your eyes here in Luke's intro and they're trying to trick you and write a fake history? Or do you think he's, what do you think's going on? Cause some people think Luke's lying. He's lying on purpose to try and deceive you or yeah. How do you navigate this? This is fun. Well, you know, I, I think I've told you the story before when I was writing the book that I had post-it notes, like, to remind me, like, these aren't special. And I don't mean that in, like, a pejorative way, but just to remind me of, like, where you started your question, which is, you know, we, we are all sort of introduced to these texts in a vacuum, right? Like, you know, we don't worship the other gods anymore. And so, like this one is stuck. And so uh, you've got 2000 years of interpretation that's been built on top of these texts and they lose their context. I was actually thinking, this is totally an aside, um, but I've been listening to a podcast lately called 60 songs that explain the nineties. I lived through the nineties. right? And like, I listened to the, this guy, like evaluate, like, where did this song come from? I'm like, Oh, I forgot that. Oh, do you remember that? <laughs> You know, like, oh, God, that song, like, I completely forgot. And I, I know this isn't the same thing, except, like, what it shows me. I've actually recommended it to my students sometimes because the 90s are back, like, the pants are back. I got to, like, you know, go into the basement and see if I still have some stuff because I'll look, like, on point. Um, I know how to do 90s. But anyway, like, listening to this podcast... Like, no song is in a vacuum, right? Like, I hear, like, a popular song. How did it get popular? Who was listening to it? How did that artist get to that point? What was their background? What was their training? What were, who were the other musicians they worked with? Who did those mus musicians work with? How do you realize that, like, you know, this particular song comes out of a tradition from a particular region, right? Like, all the same things are there, and it kind of blows my mind because... I can't even do the granularity off the top of my head of a song I lived through, right? You, do you see what I mean? Like we were, I was there. <laughs> like maybe that's more of a reflection on me. But the, the fun thing about that podcast is like it takes something that was in living memory and then gives you that context. Because I think sometimes too, we receive music in a way that's like that, right? Like we listen to the song, we just like the song. We don't analyze like, you know, how that musician put that together, who helped them sample, like, you know, what kind of ska band they were in like 10 years before I was listening to the George Michael episode right before this. Um, so anyway, you get, you get the idea. And that's the thing we have to do. I think with the gospel authors, um, we have to put them in that context to try to understand how we get to that point of thinking of them in isolation or sort of this kind of idealized form of like just, outside of time, outside of context, um, because it says more about how they were subsequently used than the content. So thinking about Luke, right? Like in context. Okay, well, I'll do this in isolation, like angels popping out of nowhere. Yeah, right? Like that's a little unexpected, right? right However, right, right. when I, or the resurrection, but when I think about it in context, there are a lot of ancient texts in the first and second century making those kinds of claims or even more extreme claims, you know, mm -hmm. like there are claims about people, you know, like wrestling with like long dead deities from Homer. <laughs> like I'm um, thinking about um, Philostratus or Philostratus there, right? Like the Heroicus. Um, there are claims about like back to paradoxography, people who are living thousands of years. There are claims back to Miller's work about like people experiencing apotheosis and becoming gods after they die and their bodies rising up to heaven. That's not exclusive to Judaism or Christianity either. Right. The angels come from somewhere. Um, there's an excellent article out there and I'll have to, it's, it's older now, but about how the whole depiction of the archangel Michael comes from Addis, um, you know, like the visual imagery. Uh, you even have, uh, you know, when I teach a class on iconography, images of Mary and Jesus, um, certain positions there go back to Cupid and Psyche. Like you, you can see how, especially in mediums like writing or art or music, that there's kind of this iterative process where like you know back to kind of the last question like you know certain kinds of motifs or approaches are aesthetically aesthetically successful i'm trying to get that word out but you know that people know that they work or there's like a code kind of embedded in there and how people interpret things i don't think the gospels are that different from what is already out there in the literary landscape what's already going on in terms of quote-unquote cultic practices elsewhere um, you know, it, it takes a little bit of adjusting, like back to my post-it notes to realize that, 
Um, but once I don't think of the Gospels in isolation and I start to think about some of the fantastic claims in other texts from the same time, um, it, it, I can see the the borrowings, I can see the context, and I can I can understand it a little bit better. So just to, I guess, to get direct on Luke's preface, that prologue there, if I, I'm nuancing this for the viewer, and then I want to get to the Super Chats, because we only have 60 amazing minutes with you today, and I, I have to have you back. We've got, when time permits, of course, may yes. the gods make that happen, um, <laughs> is... Is Luke, try, in your estimation, do you think Luke sh or whoever is put this intro here trying to make you convinced that they're writing history? Or do you think, what do you think is happening with this little? Yeah, it's just what you do. Like when you're writing a text like this, it's just what you do. I, I know that sounds a little bit like uh, maybe flimsy, but like, let me give you an example. Uh, you have like Plutarch, you know, doing something like Alexander the Great, like writing a life of Alexander the Great. He tells you, here's my source material. Here's how I approached it. Here's what I referenced. I talked to eyewitnesses. Here's why you can trust me. Medical writers. This is actually really interesting for people who debate that question, like, is Luke a doctor? Like, I know that comes up all the time. I think some of that could come from the fact that you have medical writers who will say, I've heard all kinds of treatments that are out there. I've read all the literature. I've talked to people like what they're doing. You can trust me on what I'm about to tell you because I've done all the research and my my version of this is a better one, right? Writers do this all the time, whether it's biography, historiography, medical, like it's just something that's super common. Obviously, it, not everyone is doing it. And that's why you don't see every gospel writer doing it. But there is a percentage of the writing community <laughs> in the first and second centuries who put this kind of preface on something where they are trying to really convince the reader to trust them. And that makes a lot of sense when you're about to have angels pop out, right? Like you need to have that kind of um, assurance. And the additional thing with Luke, where the preface makes sense to me is that he has a patron. You have to recognize your patron. There is no way somebody just bankrolled you to like write this thing. And you're not like, hey, you know, like I wrote this thing, your money didn't go to waste. I talked right. to everybody. I read everything I could, probably because, like, this patron had a library that this person was allowed to use. Like, thanks for the resources. Appreciate the cash. You can trust me. This is a good one. You asked for a good one. Here comes a good one. And, by the way, better than all these other ones that I read. You know, and I talked to so-and-so, and I put this together, right? Like, if you just kind of take the language and make it more accessible, um, you can see what he's doing there. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Wow. I love that without reading into the motives too much, but it's pretty obvious. You've got, it, there's a patron, there's money. He's, and there seems to be a, an agenda in the literature. You can find the motifs the academics have brought out. Every time the Christians are found guilty, they just so happen to be found innocent in every scenario. So <laughs> it, there's so many interesting um, things. And no wonder a lot of the apologists that I've engaged or had conversations with, are resistant to the fact that I wondered, and by the way, Dr. Richard C. Miller's working on something where I'm not going to give away too much, but he teased it in the last live stream that he's like, what if the Christians weren't as innocent as we have been kind of told in the propaganda of Christian history? Like mm -hmm. why were the Romans in periods of time actually putting them to death or they're being prosecuted? What's going on? What are the Christians doing to break what laws? And anyway, well, I, well here I want to recommend to um, the work of Canada Moss on this. And you've interviewed her before too on her wonderful book on the myth of persecution, where she points out there was like one place for like a couple of years where they're like actually executing Christians. Um, but there's a lot of reason to think that that was a claim that mm -hmm. was put forward, that was um, exaggerated for certain reasons um, to kind of create a, a dynamic of like um, in group, out group, you could call it, or um, this like dynamic of, um, you know, especially as Christianity starts to rise, like, you know, these humble beginnings, you know, where it was like us against them and then they rise up, right? Um, and so I, I think it's important to keep that in mind. I mean, there are scholars who even dispute whether the letter um, from Pliny to Trajan that talks about persecuting Christians is actually authentic or if it's later. 
Um, so there's perhaps some chicanery going on. <laughs> we'll say that with, um, <laughs> yeah, with, with that, with that narrative, because like you say, you have to always, um, like, I'm not saying never trust and we have to be critical about absolutely everything, but we definitely need to think about why we, uh, not take anything for granted, like think about why we take certain kinds of claims, um, as legitimate claims, especially for social context. And there could be reasons to question them. Kind of goes back to my whole thing about, you know, human beings are kind of a mess and human beings are responsible for all this stuff that we're talking about ultimately. Right. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, maybe that says more about me being a trusting person. I don't know, but <laughs> By the way, my, the queen of myth vision, my partner, my wife, uh, are so much alike like that. Like <laughs> when I was a fundamentalist arguing with her to try and tell her how this is really inerrant and, and God, like, you know, like really trying to argue the validity. And she's like, um, men wrote it. And I'm like, moved by the Holy spirit. And she's like, you don't think any of the men's ideas actually got in there? And I'm like, you know, like I'm put, she, she was like you. So one little statement. And then my last question in the super chat is this. Sure. I read uh, Ignatius's letter to the Romans. Oh my gosh. It was the most suicidal letter I've ever heard. He even says it. Maybe one point, the bread for the beast, that kind yeah. of. Yeah, I'll yeah. be grinded into the tummy, into the teeth. and if They won't but, eat me. I'm going to open their mouth up and put myself in there. Yeah. Exactly. It's just like, if they won't kill me, yeah. I will make them. Like yeah. this is what he's so anyway, uh, whoa, a little bit, you know, so then the last question I have is how much influence in your scholarship and your research, do you think the gospels are tainted by Paul? So when we're reading yeah. something about Jesus, is this really Jesus in your estimation? Cause you know, the schools of scholarship, there's all sorts of interpretations and understandings. How much are we actually looking at Paul when we're looking at Jesus and we don't know that actually, this isn't Jesus. This is Paul and Paul's mission, Paul's theology in the caricature of Jesus in the Gospels. What, what well, do you think? I, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So um, it gives me the chance to talk about something I was thinking about um, earlier on when we started the conversation, which is a lot of these things that I'm talking about as tropes or, you know, something you would find in historiography or part of kind of the established literary tradition of the age. A lot of these things um, reflect a different what let me just use this language, a different standard of what's historical than we have now. And I think we've talked about this in, in the past, so I won't belabor it too much. But, you know, like we expect if we read something in a book that it's been like peer reviewed, gone through a check, like the footnotes work, like, etc. Like, this is where like, sometimes scandals come in when we realize these things aren't, you know, as well checked as um, we thought that they were. Or like in media, I think people have more suspicion about media now. But like, there was a reasonable expectation that if something's reported, it's true, right? Um, so we have an idea of history writing today, that I think is different than antiquity, which is, um, I think, something that's situational in this respect, you know, because we can um, record things, because we can Google things, because, you know, at the touch of a finger with a database, we have more resources now than we even did 20 years ago. I mean, it's, it's sort of amazing what's happened just in my lifetime um, in terms of like resources. We can do that kind of checking um, and, and we expect that, you know, like receipts. <laughs> like we expect to be able to have receipts. In antiquity, the idea of uh, being able to like look at the receipts was like a, a very different thing because people weren't as mobile. Um, information didn't travel as easily. It's not to say that it didn't, but it wasn't as immediate. You couldn't just, you know, like make quick reference to confirm a date or uh, an event, right? Um, so we're, we're dealing with word of mouth, we're dealing with, if we wanna call it oral tradition, we can call it that. But there were also some mechanisms in place for writers to indicate that what they were giving you was more or less um, the best truthful information that they could, or at least giving you an impression of what they know to be the truth, even if it's not to the letter absolutely what happened. And people, I think, had a broader tolerance for this in antiquity than we do. Does that make sense? Like, I, I think, they would be okay with like, ah, oh, you know, if they, if they disputed a date, you know, like, or <laughs> if um, there was sort of a structure, like something like saying, I, I talked to eyewitnesses, the eyewitnesses give you like that, that invocation gives you a better sense that like, okay, at least you talk to somebody who's making a claim that they're there. But I think people also understood 
sometimes eyewitnesses aren't exactly, you know, like super, super reliable, but better than nothing, right? Um, there are other kinds of techniques uh, in writing that you could use that the idea was to give an impression of what somebody was like rather than like, this is absolutely what happened, absolutely what they said, the absolute date. So I think that's why, you know, I, I don't get as worked out about that stuff because I think they're doing the best job they can, you know, like um, nuancing these things. And I think they had a different idea. I, I really like the work of Bowersock on this fiction is history. Um, which is an older book, but I think it's very accessible and um, a good resource for what I'm talking about. Um, as far as Paul goes, and this is related, and I, we actually do talk about this in the course, um, I think Paul is very much an influence for the gospel writers. Uh, and one example, and I actually, I, I think we end the course with a paper that I gave for the Society of Biblical Literature Conference. Um, on this question because so in the 19th century there were already German scholars that suspected that the characterization of Jesus was actually based on Paul in the Gospels that they had read Paul's letters Paul represents sort of this ideal or aspirational version of what a good Christian is supposed to look like right I'll just use that kind of anachronistic language and so then Jesus ends up embodying the ideal that Paul put forward in his letters. So that was something someone like Gustav Volkmar was already doing in the 19th century, that the entire biography of Jesus is based on Paul. Um, that's a little complex, right? Um, that requires a lot, of, a lot of moves to make that kind of claim. So what I um, argued in the um, talk that I gave as part of this um, was that you can see I think something like what we call the Last Supper, um, where Paul says, I received from the Lord, which as a formulation, uh, I, I think you can make a reasonable case that he means divination experience. And I recommend the work of Jennifer Isle on this, that he's receiving from the Lord, meaning Jesus, information about what he should do, about Jesus's life, <laughs> you know, the Lord's life, about things that he um, thinks should happen. Uh, including telling him about this supper that he held before his death. So Paul goes into detail about this is what happened at the Last Supper. This is what the Lord did. This is what he said. This is what we should do, you know, in our communion. Um, and then when you get to the gospel writers 20 years later, they tell you the story of the Last Supper. <laughs> and it looks like what Paul said. And so uh, what I point out is that if you took a study Bible and you look at, you know, like the little footnotes in the study Bible, for the passages where Paul talks about the Last Supper, having you know received that information from a divination experience from Jesus, it'll say, this must be an oral tradition that goes all the way back to Jesus and his followers because somehow it made its way into Paul's letters, but it also made its way into the gospel. So there must be like this single point for which there is a trajectory to Paul and then a trajectory to the gospel writers. That makes absolutely no sense to me. Paul told you exactly where he got it from, right? He did not get it from the oral tradition of the followers of Jesus at the time. He tells you divination experience, right? I got it directly. I got this information directly from the Lord. There is no reason to suspect that he's telling you something that he got from another means. I mean, you could make that argument, I suppose, like he's trying to compete, you know, with like Peter or something. Like there's a way you could make the argument, but he tells you what he did. Mm -hmm. Why can't it just be more linear? An explanation is that the gospel writers, writers were reading Paul's letters and, oh, Paul told us, and, you know, we are going to authorize a divination experience that Paul, the apostle had of the risen Christ, good as historical. So kind of back to what I was saying before, like fiction versus history, right? Sorry, I have students texting me, I have to close the window. Um, but that's like as good as, that's as good as his, historical, right? Like you can report that in your gospel, because it came from Jesus. It doesn't have to come from an oral tradition from a follower who was there, but it, it came from Jesus to Paul to the gospel writers like that makes a lot more sense to me and it's the, exactly what i'm talking about in terms of like other forms of information are okay a divination experience is as good as somebody talking to you right it doesn't it doesn't have to be um our, our stark distinctions um in modernity i think don't exactly apply um in this context 
Thank you so much. <clears throat> we can get lost forever. So I'm going to hit these super chats. People have questions. Mm -hmm. and hopefully we can get them knocked out before you have to go. Equal scales. Thank you so much for the super chat. Robin mentioned Last Supper anointing rooster death yeah. crucifixions in Gospels versus Petronius ancient novels. How is Jesus crucifixion historical, not literary? We don't have any other figures leading up to that point who have been crucified and resurrected in this way. Um, so I actually take the crucifixion as something historical. Also, Paul tells us this. Um, and so people who are wandering around, you know, including, you know, Peter, Paul, Paul not having known Jesus, but knowing people who were there, tells us these are facts, right, uh, about the life of Jesus. There's a scholar named Jay-Z Smith who uh, wrote about this. Um, the concept was called Dying and Rising Gods. Um, I think the Golden Bough talks about this too, Fraser. So in the 19th and 20th century, there was an attempt to try to figure out, are there other deities who were crucified and resurrected that Christianity is borrowing from, you know, or thinking about like Mithras or something. There's no crucifixion there, but the idea of, you know, like a senator who dies. Um, and so that concept of the dying and rising gods was debated for a while, but really um, any concrete examples and, you know, somebody should maybe test me on this, but I've looked into it in the past. Um, the more, uh, the, the examples we have of other kind of Greco-Roman deities who experience this kind of death, um, any kind of crucifixion or execution like a crucifixion, um, they're after Christianity. So then you have to start to think that that's a Greco-Roman borrowing of something that's coming from a Christian context. You just don't, we just don't see it. So for that reason, I think that that piece of it is historical and also crucifixion. That was a huge uh, thing to get over, honestly, for people in antiquity. The only people who were crucified, it was the worst capital punishment that you could experience. Crucifixion, I mean, and that's saying something considering like people were executed in the amphitheater, like back to your lions. Um, it was really a brutal death and usually reserved for people who just had no rights. So non-citizens, enslaved persons. In Rome, they used to crucify dogs every year and march them through the streets. I mean, this is a punishment reserved for really, um, I mean, this is why they say to be hung on a tree is cursed, right? Like th th this is a very terrible uh, form of death in antiquity. And so um, that's a true innovation within Christianity, honestly, the, the fact that somebody could face this kind of execution, this horrific kind of execution, um, and to subvert that into he's really the son of God, that that would have been very compelling for people. Um, but that particular element, um, the actual crucifixion itself as the form of death, I think we can think of as historical. Now, everything around it, like an earthquake when it happens, you know, like that stuff, you see in other kinds of writing. The idea of some kind of cosmic event or some kind of natural disaster taking place around the death or an event in the life of a hallowed figure or an important figure or a philosopher or, you know, um, a deity of some kind, that's everywhere. Um, so that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> but, Just to give a little, little pushback slash context there is that like, um, is it not possible that in the decades following this Jesus cult's origins, that they would take a, a catastrophic event of a death of a hero or demigod figure similar to other myths that have deaths may not be crucifixion, but Addis cutting off his junk and bleeding to death or like crazy <laughs> other examples. And they just kind of modeled one. I believe there was a guy, I think he was crucified too, but I'm trying to give some credibility or potential credibility to saying, is it possible that a legend completely whole cloth is invented be between those decades, I tend to think that there's legend built up around a guy who was crucified and it just works in the motif of death because it's well, ubiquitous. I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I think that, I mean, if you look at the crucifixion scenes across even the canonical gospels, they're not the same. The time right. of day is different. The thing he says on the cross is different. Who's there is different. The arrest is different. I mean, like if you break it down, there are some similarities for sure, but they're all different. Um, the thing that if we think about literary motif, just, you know, in the context of the question, um, like I, I, I'm pretty sure that that's a historical statement that this guy was crucified. What exactly happened in the context of that crucifixion is the thing that I'm saying has literary elements. So um, even if I go back to, say, Matthew, um, just because we haven't talked about Matthew yet. Um, back to that idea of like cosmic element or like natural phenomena. 
like there's a star that tells the magi where to go and then when he dies you know there's an earthquake right like that that kind of event that would have been something that would have resonated with somebody to say oh so he was important this was right. yeah he's on par with these other figures right. um and he's in the a, hall of fame he's in the hall of fame there's a book that i recommend hold on <laughs> is this your friend on matthew hmm is this the oh sorry go ahead go ahead oh no no so this is um can you see i can't see can you see this Documents for the study of the gospels, the gospels. Yes. Yeah, this is an, an older book, um, but I, I assign pieces of it um, to my students sometimes. Um, and it's by Fortress Press. Um, let me see, what year is it? It's nine, whoa, first edition, 1980. So when I say <laughs> it's an older book, it's an older book. Uh, maybe I'll write an update someday. But literally what it does is it takes a bunch of documents from the context, the literary context that we're talking about and shows you some similarities to what you see in the gospels. So like I have tabs right here um, on birth narrative. So birth and youth, the birth of Plato, like you get the idea. Um, like, so the birth of Augustus, like, and it's just like little short passages that when you read it, you're like, oh, that's where the gospels got that, <laughs> right? They have a collection of teachings, Aesop's fables. Aesop's fables have that kind of pithy, like, to the point, like moralistic turn that you see in some of say the parables or the stories of, you know, the Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. So like I just opened up to the rich man and the tanner, the money lover, enemies, the cat and the birds, the mule, you know what I mean? Like you, you have these like little stories um, that have kind of an ethical tint What's to the them. Of that book again? It's called, uh, can you see it? Documents Sorry, for the Study of the Gospel. <laughs> yeah. David, uh, um, Cartledge and Dungan are the editors. It doesn't even have everything. Um, when I teach my Greco-Roman context of early Christianity course, I use this as a basis and then I supplement it. I just give it to my students and I tell them like, open up the New Testament, open up these documents, and I give them themes like, show me natural disasters, show me miracles, show me pithy you know, parables. Some of them last semester found out um, some of the philosophers will look for followers among fishermen. <laughs> Pythagoras, I guess, does that in some texts, right? So like all of those motifs, I'm not saying the gospel authors necessarily are referring to all of them, but back to literary context. Um, so something like the crucifixion being supplemented by ideas of like natural phenomena um, makes sense to me. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to have to blast through these. Um, and I have to okay. ask real quick. And uh, Grandmaster Stash, I know, I'm dying. Was the myth-making surrounding the Gospels intentional to paint Judea in a better light or create a new Roman mythos? I don't know if you can hold out for like two minutes. Okay, I, I guess I'll be talking <laughs> for two minutes on this. Okay, so um, I think what's going on with Judea in this period, so the Gospels are supposed to be written after the Jewish War. Pretty much everybody agrees on this. You know, whether it's exactly at 70, that can be disputed. Um, hold on, another text in front of me. Um, that can be disputed. But I think what's going on is that there's a keen interest uh, in the period following the Jewish war in Judean stuff. Uh, in other words, uh, if you're in Rome, and Rome, of course, is the still the intellectual center of the empire at the time, you're seeing the Flavian Amphitheater, what we call the Colosseum, being built. You have coins being minted with the Judea Capta. It's called an image of Judea as a woman with her hands tied behind her back, celebrating the victory in Judea. You have the Arch of Titus. You have the triumphal march um, of the Flavians celebrating their victory in Judea. People were aware of this war. They were aware of Judea as this hub, uh, not only um, for you know all the political machinations and the warfare that took place there, but also arguably for trade as well. Uh, you had to kind of go through that region to conduct trade in West Asia. And so people who uh, would have been interested, I think, in the Gospels and, and that tier of society was aware of Judea as an interesting location to consider, particularly after that war, then add on to that, that those who were part of that war who ended up becoming prisoners of war afterwards um, were likely enslaved and placed around the empire. So you would have been interested in these new people that you're encountering who are essentially refugees after that war. 
So that was taking place all over the empire. And then we know that before this, especially in the first century, um, Judean stuff was interesting in terms of how the scriptures, the Judean scriptures as a holy book, was both ancient, therefore interesting, but also kind of a key to this very ancient tradition and this hallowed religion. This is why Judaism was quote unquote protected in the Roman Empire and um, Jews were not forced to convert. Their tradition was older. Um, it was also associated in some circles with Egypt, which was also hallowed in the first and second centuries uh, as a cultural hub. And so it had all of these touchstones in the ancient Mediterranean world and imagination that I think made it interesting. We know, I think uh, you and I might have talked about this, that we have uh, an example, I think it was in the first century of Judeans being kicked out of Rome, whether this actually happened, but um, because they were charging a fee to interpret dreams, some of them. Um, and so they were using holy books to do this, um, i.e. the Hebrew Bible. Um, so people were interested in Judaism. People were interested in the Hebrew Bible they're interested in the antiquity of that religion, and they were interested, especially in Judea as a region after that war. And so I think all of that kind of conspired to, not conspired, but I mean, that combination made it interesting for people uh, when the gospels mm -hmm. start to tell you about Jewish practices, teachings, the region uh, would have been interesting for people. No more super chats, please, everybody. I do not want Robin to hate me. Um, you know, she's told me before the show, she's sitting on the fence and she's not sure where to take the love or the hate. And so I'm trying to, I'm just, um, Dr. Andy, thank you for the super sticker. Uh, John D your argument in, uh, what is early, this? Oh. origins of early Christian literature? Okay. Got it. Against, uh, Adar, is it Adela Yarbrough Collins about Must Marcus be. historical narrative is over my head. Can you dumb down what she is saying and what is, what your case is? Oh gosh. I don't even remember. Um, I mean, I'm sure I'm talking, I think she wrote the Hermonia series, mm -hmm. um, which means she wrote the commentary on Mark. Um, gosh, what did I say about that? <laughs> <I don't laughs> that's how it um, no, but that's, I mean, I'm sure I could do it in a second. Um, uh, I actually have the book here because I was looking at it earlier. I just have to try to think about where uh, I talked about Collins, but um, give me one second. Uh, is this like this is terrible TV, right? <laughs> okay, people are hanging out. Okay, four people hanging out. Sign up for the course, please, everybody. Uh, we have a gospels course, and that is seven or eight lectures, and then oh. the yes, huh? okay. So, um, she argues that um, the gospel of Mark is an ancient biography. And so I seem to talk about this at various points. Um, luckily, I had this open. <laughs> so I talk about it in um, certain places, especially um, it looks like I talk about it in chapter four when I talk about anonymous sources, but also when I'm talking just kind of generally about um, how to understand the um, genre of the gospel itself. Uh, and I talk about like when I'm talking about different kinds of sources like Petronius. So um, I think what I'm saying there, and I, I just want to preface that I think everybody is doing great scholarship and we're all contributing to a conversation. So even if I'm sort of forced into the corner of critique of a particular scholar, it's not to say that their work is not valuable or I don't think they're making good points or, you know, that it should be dismissed. So, um, yes. So just to say that, to say that off the bat, but Collins, I believe, wrote a book called uh, Is the Gospel of Mark a Biography or something along those lines. Uh, and she also, I believe, did the Hermonia series, which is a commentary series on the Gospel of Mark. So I think I'm referring to both of those works. And from what I recall, she very, um, again, just to be, I want to be careful that I might not be remembering this all correctly, but I believe that she really kind of doubled down on the idea that Mark is an ancient biography. And so therefore that really set stark parameters for what she was able to consider in terms of the literary influences of mm -hmm. Mark. I would expand that um, and for a few reasons. Um, but one reason is not only because I see other features that are not necessarily confined to biography and I don't see that we should necessarily really restrict um, our range of possibilities for comparison, but also because the gospel authors are not necessarily the same people as biographers. What I mean by that is not every, you know, most biographers in antiquity were either writing an autobiography or they're writing a biography again about like a hallowed figure, but they themselves are at, let's call it a higher social tier than what we think the gospel authors were at. 
So to say that um, the gospel authors are completely restricted to a particular genre because they are part of a, let's call it cultural or literary elite that's only um, in the purview of this particular kind of writing, the writing of a life, is possibly too restrictive. When I think that the gospel authors being at, you know, I don't think that they're, um, you know, writing for like purely recording an oral tradition for people who are illiterate, I argue against that. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's going on in the first and second century um, is what David Constan, who I also talk about in the book, is describing as an active reader. In other words, in the first and second centuries under the empire, you have the emergence of a tier of literature like magical papyri, like the Greek novel, uh, like paradoxography, that uh, is a bit of an innovation for what came before because more people are able to write now than used to be able to write. <laughs> Um, and so it's almost like this emerging tier of society that's engaging in literate practices, but are writing and reading different kinds of things. And they can innovate on that a little bit more than your average, you know, writer that came before that. Does that make that? Does that make sense? So yeah. like yeah. really elite writers writing biographies of generals and emperors, and, you know, like that was a very specific kind of writing. And you see features like we talked about the preface uh, in the Gospels of that kind of writing. But you also see. The features of this other kind of emerging writing in the first and second centuries like paradoxography like the greek novel that didn't really happen before you know it's like over the course of a few hundred years but you have this new this active reader this new kind of reader who's like kind of new to the game interested in different stuff and and you're seeing the gospels i think in that register the greek is very similar to the greek novel or paradoxography the interests are very similar so the structure of the biography is there but the the level of interest, the kind of figure being talked about, you know, mm -hmm. crucified Judean, that's not a Roman general, right? Like this is a very, very different figure. And right. I talk at the end of the book about subversive biography. Um, so this idea that there also emerges a kind of biography in the first and second century that's about a figure that's like not your traditional hero, like, like an underdog, Aesop. Is one, another one I talk about. Um, Aesop, too. Yeah, yeah, an, an enslaved person, right? Who um, you know has this unique wisdom and goes around teaching and like speaks in parables. I mean, it's very right. Um, the Alexander Romance, which is about Alexander the Great, except he's kind of, he's described as sort of like ugly and <laughs> like he's not attractive. He kind of gets by in his wits and like his magic tricks, rather than like the fact that he's a big strapping, you know, like army guy and that's all part of that tier i'm talking about too like that emerging tier so to just say it's a biography to me was too restrictive i think i think that's the simple way to describe well it. said i love that answer and good question john doc pleroma not in the house if marcion was working with a proto luke can we deduce a further redaction layer was added later as a polemic against his interpretations adding mm -hmm. luke one through two how would this affect traditional dating you know, the more um, time goes on, so like the redaction thing, I'm just getting old. Um, <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, I, I don't know anymore. <laughs> like, I, I, I'll come back to it maybe like redaction, um, I, I think is super interesting. Um, but I also think that oftentimes it's a bit speculative. Um, however, to this question uh, about dating, especially like vis-a-vis -vis Marcion, um, I think that increasingly there's a um, an emerging conversation within scholarship that the Gospels are second century. And um, a lot of that construction is based on the idea that there had to be an answer to Marcy. And some of that, too, has to do with the fact that we don't see them mentioned, right, until the second century by anyone, right? So the idea that the Gospels, I mean, for sure, are part of a polemic that's emerging in that century. They're, they're football. You know, the Gospels become a football for these competing claims. Uh, and especially, you know, with Marcion um, likely having a proto-Luke, I, I think it gives us an idea if we can't identify specific redactional layers, at the very least, we can talk about these Gospels being used as that football. And um, so I think we need to start looking more into the second century as a more secure, maybe not starting point, but like location to begin the conversation. And I'm thinking here, about the work of Dan Alucci. He actually has an article um, 
called Cata Pac-Man. <laughs> uh, so Cata being according to, like that's the titles of the gospels, but he relates what's going on with the authorship of the gospels and anonymity, but also the second century context where the gospel or where the church fathers are talking about the gospel authors to the way that video games like Pac-Man had an author. Do you know who it is? Or do we just talk about Pac-Man, right? Yeah, exactly. So you can like get into um, who the specific author is of say a video game, it's known, but most people just talk about the video game. And so he relates that in the second century to the way um, that this kind of um, discussion was going on with the church leaders about the gospels, even though they're not saying Mark, Matthew, Luke, right? Um, it's it's kind of the, the Catapac Man model. So I recommend Dana Lucci's work on this. Thank you so much. Do not hate me. Do not hate me. I'm trying. And I told everybody, no more super chats. Thank you for the support. Kareem Moore, the canonical gospels are fine with miracles or demonic pigs. Any yeah. push to also include a resurrection scene could have been nice proselytizing tool. Well, I mean, this is what, so Mark ends with the women being afraid, right? Um, but then you have post-resurrection appearance. Somebody realized this, you know, like at, at some point, like Mark ended in a really kind of crappy way if you're trying to have a proselytizing tool. Okay, so I just denied my own thing about like, I don't care about reaction. I <laughs> Apparently I do. Um, because I, I, you know, think that the, the Mark ending uh, is a great example uh, of this. Like somebody realized somewhere that like, you know, they run away and they're afraid and they don't say anything. Well, how did we get here? You know, and so yeah. you have to have like post-resurrection appearances for sure. Um, so I, I think that you get that, you get that in Acts, right? Like you get the sequel. Um, so somebody realizes you're on exactly the right track. Some people started to realize this along the way. Thank you so much for that. Nitty in the house. Is Robin familiar with Henry J. Cadbury's 1920 Cambridge Harvard Press work to show Luke is likely not a physician? I had a student do an independent study last, like a full year ago. He was pre-med and he was determined Luke was a physician. And so I think we looked at that. that I, I don't think he was. <laughs> so it was one of those things where I was like, you know, letting this student work with me. And like, I was completely open to him proving me wrong. Um, right. But I wanted him to try to show me all the scholarship and then like do kind of a critical reading of, um, you know, like, why would we support or not support that conclusion? So I think I looked at it even just like a year ago. Um, and I think that it's a bit of an overreading of what's going on in Luke. However, I can kind of understand how some people um, reach that conclusion in context, in part because of things like the preface. Back to the Hermonia series, um, I was looking at the Luke Hermonia thing probably like two months ago. I can't remember why now. Um, Is it for me texting you about it? <laughs> what? Oh, were you? Were you the one? Yeah, that was it. It was I you. made your life hell. That's yeah, why I wondered. If that was why I was looking at it. Yeah. Okay. That's why I was looking at it. Was that like two months ago? It was. Pro like, I'd say a month and a half ago. The, the whole ago? preface was a huge question. Yeah. So he was texting me about Luke's preface, and I was like sending like while trying to put my kid to bed. I'm like, you know, one hand <laughs> wiping like long dissertations on like Luke's preface. That's why. So I looked at the Hermonia series on that, which was written by Francois Bovon. Um, and he references a bunch of medical treatises or, you know, at least like I, I remember one for sure, like in a block quote, but he has a section on the preface where he's like, yeah, physicians had this kind of introduction to their writings all the time, which because I usually go like, you know, my defaults Plutarch, I found that really super interesting. And, you know, automatically I was like, why didn't that student, <laughs> you know, like tell me about the medical treatises that we worked on um, that would have helped his case. But I think the reason people make that claim, and if I remember some of Cadbury's argument correctly, um, if that was the, I assume that was the thing I was reading, um, you know, I'm taking the, the super chat for granted that that was the exact author and, and title. Um, but I remember this, you know, reading some of these older pieces, the argument is that he's more specific about disease processes. So rather than, you know, um, just call something, I don't know, like a cough, he calls it, <laughs> you know, tuberculosis. It's not that, but you get what I mean. Like he, he's a little more specific. Um, the only reason I have a problem with that is that we know elsewhere, like in Matthew, there are more specific um, identifying features of the different kinds of diseases people present with. 
that just get translated as epilepsy, you know, like for simplicity's sake, even though in the Greek it's more specific. So um, I don't know that that's exclusive to Luke either. That would be one counter argument as well. Um, so, and then also you have the later theological argument about Luke as the physician for Paul, blah, 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 blah you know, yeah. The companion, so, the weak yeah. passages, the blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah Thank yeah. you, Nitty. Jack Bull says, keep reading Ignatius, friends. Thanks for the pod, Jack. Thanks for the super. Appreciate that. Stephen Eastman says, Paradox paradoxography yeah. reminds me of modern urban legends where it's where it always happens to be or to a friend of a friend or is given yeah. a fake background to make it seem real yeah it's like the ancient equivalent of like my boyfriends in canada or <laughs> i think i compared it once to um news of the world uh from when i was a kid bat boy found in cave um you know like there's there's an appetite for you know, i'm now like on tiktok um, there's an appetite for like, you know, the algorithms figured out I like like old, old Judge Judy clips and like, <laughs> oh, I just, <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, I, I keep getting like scenes from cops. I don't know like why I'm stuck. It's that or like abandoned cats. I'm like stuck in a bad algorithm right now. But like, it's actually kind of similar. Like these little dramas, you know, like little short dramas. We love those. Yeah. Human beings love those. Um, and right. so it's like. Yeah, an ancient equivalent of like TikTok or News of the World or, you know, friend of a friend for sure. It's gossip. It's ancient gossip. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that. Doc Pleroma not. Does Matt consciously correct, contradict Paul's understanding of Jesus as the first mm -hmm. fruit in 2752 when the bodies of the saints rose before Jesus, rearticulating the Jewish understanding of the general resurrection? Well, you know, I'd want to, yeah, I'd want to go back and look at that. Um, I think that there's a lot of aspects of Paul, like I, I can, you know, I feel bad because this is 20 bucks. Um, <laughs> but there are a lot of aspects um, of Paul that I think get corrected. Um, one of the ones that stands out to me is actually, uh, you know, and I, different scholars have had different arguments about this, but Paul says Jesus was buried. Um, and there's a lot of like, you know, was being buried just means like a general, like he could be put in a tomb, but like, and he meant buried, but in a tomb, like just kind of a general statement. Uh, I think it doesn't Collins, not maybe not Collins, um, Dominic Crossan, doesn't he say like, it's just kind of, or maybe I actually think Crossan says he was buried in the ground, you know, because there's this, this argument that like, well, if you were crucified, you can't take the body. Like that's a whole thing, you know, that you I can't remember, but I don't think Crossan thinks he was actually he might have been buried in the actual ground or was in a common yeah. grave, or was ate by dogs. I think he's even yeah. said, you know, just Yeah, I'm dogs. pretty sure Crossan has said that because it's it's one of these kinds of points of debate, right? Like you had to willingly ignore Paul literally saying the guy was buried, which corresponds with like historical expectation, which is what I think Crossan is getting at. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm remembering his argument correctly. Um, to have the empty tomb. But as Miller has talked about, Richard C. Miller has talked about, and I've talked about as well, the empty tomb was common to paradoxography, common to um, things like the satiricon, and common to this idea of the missing body representing the deification um, or the resurrection of a figure um, or the apotheosis of a figure. So um, let me just reread this. The first fruits when the bodies of the saints rose before Jesus articulated Jesus understanding. Oh, okay, so this is also um, talking about how I think Paul says that uh, he creates like a hierarchy right. of who's going to go first. Yeah, uh, first and, and it becomes like kumbaya <laughs> later on. Um, this could also be a reflection too of, you know, Matthew seems to be his his big corrective if you want to call it that to the gospel of mark is not enough references to hebrew scripture and certainly paul is innovating as a pharisee um who has his own interpretation of the significance of christ vis-a-vis -vis the messiah paul's already innovating a lot um he'll go back say like in galatians to hagar and sarah to make his case like obviously he knows the text well um, but he he's innovating, I think, possibly in a too expansive way for someone like Matthew. So it makes sense to me that um, that kind of corrective would come into place. The other thing I'll say um, briefly is that we have to keep in mind that Matthew had access to Paul, no doubt in my mind, or access to Paul via Mark, however we want to construe that. 
but I think we have to be careful about how much of each piece of writing we do comparison since two, each gospel writer could have conceivably had. I try to be cautious about this idea like, well, this appears in one particular line of, um, you know, a letter of Paul. Therefore, Matthew absolutely had it, had to know about it. And he's absolutely referring to this particular concept here. It's possible right. Matthew doesn't know, right? Like Matthew only had a couple of, you know, passages of, you know, Corinthians and you know what I'm saying? Like, and some scholars have done that, that work. I think, um, uh, uh, I won't name anybody right now, um, just in case I get it wrong, but there are scholars who've been doing that work. Like, you know, can I tell which letters of Paul a particular writer has, right? right. Um, and so I think we need to do, uh, I'm, Anne-Marie Lyondike is one person um, who comes to mind for me and I do reference her in the book. Um, because she talks about actual like findings we've had um, at archaeological sites where you only have a few pages of Romans and like maybe a couple pages of Galatians and that's it, right? And, like, so we have to think about the possibility that some of these authors didn't have absolutely everything at their disposal. We can do acts of comparison to come up with topoi structure, think about the literary landscape, um, but we have to be careful too that we don't assume everybody had the same access to everything we have access to now. Thank you for that. Stephen Eastman says, thanks, Robin, for your time. Professor Trobish, 2023 book suggests canonical New Testament written by a literary group, including Irenaeus, responding to Marcion's New Testament. Yeah, and I think you recommended this book to me. Um, I'm going to have to definitely look at it. Um, I mean, that doesn't shock me at all um i think it's uh, back to this like you know there's a conversation happening in the field more and more in this direction much to my chagrin because i don't like reading the church fathers <laughs> so i keep seeing these and i'm like oh that makes a lot of sense Ugh, i don't want to have to read you know I, you know i'd already took i took courses in grad school and i didn't enjoy having to learn about like every council um but I, I'll take a look at that book. I think it's really uh, an interesting premise. I'm looking it up right now. Is it uh, trying to find the dates though? Let me open up uh, just, okay. Let me get you off of here. I don't want to keep you too long. <laughs> Thank you for that, Stephen. I'm going to look it up after Q source. Wasn't Inanna hung from a stick and resurrected three days later? I don't know. Um, that's not who I was thinking of. There's some deity that Smith talks about who was not, crucified but put in a crucifixion position on a on a rock and then but i think that they figured out that that story was later like pre post-states christianity but i don't know if it was this deity off the top of my head like i said yeah. somebody check me on that hear, but. i can already hear the apologist saying see she said that this is so unique and it's like every it's story unique. in many i mean you can compare them and see how unique the inanna story is there is no comparison identical you know that kind of stuff i would love to dig in here but to be honest with you i'm afraid i don't know this franchise the stab rakapula book and uh oh yeah I mean, she does mention something about inanna she descends into the underworld and then ascends uh and i think it is three days but that's a yeah. common motif Jonah, that's three common days. Too. I think that happens to like persephone too maybe i, I mean i'd have to look I, but like the, the idea, the three days, like I have examples in the book from uh, paradoxical texts or from this chair, like three days is pretty, there's a lot of three days going on. I don't know why everything is three days, but everything is three days <laughs> in, uh, for these stories too. So it's not exclusive um, to Christianity and I don't think it's exclusive um, just like in general. I, I think you see that a lot. I actually found I'm doing a miracles origins of, of miracles, um, like origins of Jesus miracles using, uh, Dr. Cotter's work, her name, uh, I'd have to pull her name up, but like it's based on her book, which is pretty much just a source textbook for you to find the primary sources about Heracles or Hercules in the context, um, Asclepius and then Isis and showing how they pretty much do the same miracles Jesus does. Of course, different wording in some cases, but like healing the blind, resurrecting the dead, or bringing people back to life, the whole nine. And in one of them about Hercules, it mentions three days, which I was like, yo, hold up. What the heck? And yeah, because like, 
in the satyricon, the one that I talk about is the widow of Ephesus. You know, they stay in the tomb for three days and three nights. You know, like you, you just, for whatever reason, like mm -hmm. the three days um, is the three is a significant number. And I'm sure there are people who are into that kind of like numerology and antiquity who, who understand why the three, um, but that, that is a, a common um, motif for whatever yeah. reason. And then um, to that point about the healings, you know, I, I've, um, I, I think another, I'm sure somebody's done it, but kind of on my back burner of things to do um, at some point are classicists and archaeologists who have worked on Asclepius temples. There were often uh, testimonials that went along with an Asclepius temple, almost like, um, like you could imagine them on a billboard in antiquity. Like I went to this Asclepius temple and they healed my, you know, fill in the blank. And like, the, there are several about hemorrhaging women for so that wow. that to me um like you know it's like you could construe that as like the author of mark you know and, and mark five recognizing like you know let me get the greatest hits you know like right exactly. <laughs> like, and th this is something that uh, uh, would be expected of a healing god I love the one and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about and then we'll move on is that the one where um the person is born without eyeballs and they go in and the, it's like, it's saying like they didn't have even eyeballs in their sockets. And I, I have the source. It's going to be in a documentary I'm launching soon to kind of show, but like, this is not like, I just can't see out of my eyeballs. There's no balls in the socket and they come out with eyeballs. And it's like, I came into this place. Of course, you know, someone made this crap up because you want to, have people throw money at your Asclepius temple and the priests are happy to see it. But like I went in with no eyeballs and I walked out with eyeballs and could see perfectly fine. Now it's pretty, pretty ludicrous. If you, you know, ask me so um, James Apperson says, why was Saul killing Christians pre learning their views? I, I mean, uh, so uh, here's a piece I, I can recommend is um, Stan Stowers has a piece called Paul, the apostle in a book on the history of Western philosophy. Um, I think it's probably on academia.edu if you can get a hold of it. And I like the way that he, I, so I'm going to paraphrase him. This is not what he says, but I'm going to paraphrase him on this, which is essentially Paul was middle management, right? He was kind of like somebody, uh, upper management was sending him out to do the dirty work um, at the time. And so his task was to kind of, you know, ferret out these, let's call them, um, heresies. I don't really like that word, but let's call it that for the sake of illustration. But, you know, people who are having these kind of, you know, like uh, non-orthodox views at the time. And so somebody running around saying that um, a Judean from Galilee who faced capital punishment and was crucified is the son of God, the Messiah, who's supposed to be this militaristic figure, you know. And at the time, we know, again, Jesus isn't the only figure making this kind of claim, either in his lifetime or after the fact. Um, so they, you know, we're just trying to keep order, uh, in that, in that region. So I, and I, I doubt Jesus was the only example of the kind of, um, kind of, uh, subversive groups that Paul was, was targeting at the time. And by the way, just throwing this out there, Saul killing Christians, this is Acts. Yes, he pursues them. He pursues uh, them, but Acts yeah. tries to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Acts says he kills them. Paul says he pursues them. Uh, I think, you know, it's a reasonable interpretation to say that he's executing people. Um, I like to think he's just annoying people, but that's because, you know, my TikTok Paul. algorithm also gives me sad puppies and kitties. So, like, that's my personality. <laughs> so, I, I recognize that. Thank you so much. Last one, Dr. Andy says, the two of you really look good or great together. Loved to listen. Thank you much. Come again. Come again. That's very kind of you to say. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think we make a good, we make a good team. We I just really do make a great team. And I need a better, <laughs> better internet and better camera. But yeah, we make Yes, good. we do need to do that. We do need to fix that. But you know what? Um, more to come, Robin. I'm going to be located in, in Florida shortly. We so are I'm telling people to... that. I, I was trying not to say it. So, all right, it's out. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just. You know, the people who are viewing, you're the elect, the chosen ones. And so you're able to know this information. And those on the outside just don't have ears to ear or, or, or eyes to see. Yeah, so. I was trying to say, like, you're moving to Florida. We're going to hang out more. But uh, I didn't yeah. want to reveal any state secrets. So 
Um, Absolutely. We'll have projects coming up, more work. I, I just, there's so much you're doing that I find unique and interesting and it pushes against the typical grain of what everyone else is kind of doing that I appreciate. And I think if there, this is my advice to any academics who ever watch my channel, push against the grain, test the limits. Don't lose your mind in the process, of course, but like go out there, check it out, see what you can see, because I cannot imagine this is not competitive literature, which needed, it had to compete. Therefore, it had to in some way nod by using the greatest of its time if it was going to compete with the better. And that's what I love about your work, Robin. I love uh, Dennis McDonald's ideas, even though I'm not sure about all the conclusions. You know, it, it's, but he's putting it out there. And I think that that's great. You know, exactly. And yeah. so any final words from you? People sign up for the course. Oh, sign, sign up for course. the course. Um, you know, one of my favorite things that we do in the course, uh, and, you know, I, I look a little bit like a hostage, let's be honest, because <laughs> we recorded it. Yeah, because yeah, I was. Uh, he made me <laughs> sit in his hotel room till I finished it, uh, and it was like 90 degrees. Uh, yeah, so I was a little bit, a little hostage -y. It's a little hostage but it's okay. You're listening to the, but one of my favorite things we did, remembering that, you know, those few days we were together, um, is there's one class where we um, talk about what is a reasonable expectation for what we call Christian number. So we look at the work of this guy, Keith Hopkins, I think his name is. Is it Keith Hopkins? Um, but so. is it yeah. turning the wise? Um, he does the, that might be it, but he does something called Christian number and its implications. He, he wrote a yeah. piece called Christian number and its implications. And uh, we go through just thinking, you know, like it, it's hypothetical, um, but we try to identify like how many Christians can we reasonably imagine existed by 100, by 200, by 250 on the basis of the number of, you know, extant uh, letters we have of other kinds of, you know, material evidence. Uh, and this is like something that this guy did quite a bit. This scholar did quite a bit. Um, I guess he was kind of like a frustrated statistician. Like he, <laughs> he kind of goes through and, and gives these hypothetical numbers. But I think it's really interesting because, again, we're trying to make things as concrete as we possibly can. Um, like one thing I say about this point about like they're writing literature at their time period in the language of that time period in a particular context. Like what I tell my students sometimes is if you sit down right now, to write me a biography of somebody, like anybody, yourself, a, a deity, like whatever you want, you're going to write in English. It's going to have like an opening. It's going to have paragraphs, you know, like it's going to use particular kinds of language. Um, you know, it's, it's going to have certain features that place it in its time period that tell me about your relative education. I, mm -hmm. you know, you can get down to depending on how people use language or construct sentences, like where they live, you know? Um, and so, that's the kind of work I'm, or the conversation I'm trying to have in the field. Like how, how can we get more precise um, looking at these texts and thinking about their composition, their development, acts of publication, kind of back to that redaction thing. We may not be able to say with great confidence what the original gospels looked like, but we can certainly have the kind of conversations that have come up today about how to put them even in the second century context. Uh, and understand how they were, how they functioned and how they were used. And so to get much more um, fine grain about those things, I think is really interesting. So um, that's what Thank we try you. to do in the course. Yeah. We do those. You also have other courses, like you'll do lecture courses on didascaloi. So for those who are interested, Robin's doing all sorts of stuff. And so what I recommend, yes, I benefit as a platform when you sign up for our courses. Yeah. But like, I'm a team player and I really just want to see the scholars successful and do more public scholarship. And so jump on that. Um, you, you're doing lectures there and I know Canada. Yeah. Also. Yes. No, thank you for that. And thank you for creating this platform for all of us. But um, yeah, so we've got the gospel course with you. Uh, you and I also have the Paul course. Um, so those are both available, but um, I have an initiative with Dan McClellan and Canada Moss called the Daskaloy, and it's the same kind of thing, um, just public scholarship, uh, at, to be completely honest, because this is live and like not everyone, like we are losing money <laughs> on this, 
Um, but what we try to do is we just say like make a donation, whatever you feel you can give, like minimum a dollar. And once a month, one of us on a rotating schedule just gives a lecture on a topic related to the kind of material we've talked about today. So mm -hmm. um, Canada just did one on Sunday on the Gospel of Mark. Um, you can go to didascaloy.com, hit my link tree, um, or go to my website. It's all there. You can um, purchase access after the fact. I think Dan did a lecture. It's the se second tab um, on the top of the of the page to is a uh, actual Didascaloy dedicated oh. tab. Um, Dan, I think, did a lecture on what is religion. Um, yep, before um, my last one was on oh yes, yeah, science fiction and early Christianity. Um, Paul, writing, yeah, Paul on a star. Right. Oh, that's Jesus. That's baby Jesus getting shot in a spaceship into his mother. Um, but I, I, I'm going to do the next one, um, which is going to be on Paul. But I'm going to, I think, focus on Romans. We're starting a series now where we just zero in on individual books. And so I want to do more of a, you know, like introduction to Paul. But I also want to look at Romans because there are so many passages in Romans, like Romans 1, that get interpreted in very particular ways that have a lot of exact, this is perfect bookend, like I was saying, you know, uh, have a lot of effect um, for human beings today, get interpreted in ways that can be, um, you know, I, I think not as attentive to the original context of um, these, uh, of these letters as uh, could be. And so I'm going to be doing that uh, lecture on, on Paul and Romans um, some point in February, probably third week of February. So keep an eye out for that promotion. Thank you so much, Robin. I appreciate your time. Everybody go support your favorite scholars and uh, let's do this again sometime soon. I would love to. Thank you for having me. Thank you.